Hello, this is Randy with Excel for Freelancers and welcome to the Spa and Salon Manager. In this week, I'm gonna show you how to create this incredible drag and drop scheduling salon manager complete with editable appointments, one click invoicing, and a whole lot more. I cannot wait to share this with you. So let's get started. All right, thanks so much for joining me this week. I've got a really great one, the Spa and Salon Manager. So much to cover in this. We are combining scheduling. We've got pictures. I've got invoicing. I've got a full-on setup screen where you can fully customize an application like this and create those applications yourself. That's what I ultimately want you to do. I hope you do enjoy these trainings. I bring these to you each and every Tuesday, of course, and this application is absolutely free using the links down in the description, either with your email or Facebook Messenger. In fact, I've bundled over 200 of my best applications in a single zip file and made them available to you. If you'd like to pick that up, it's just $77 right now. And you you can use the links down in the description that helps keep these trainings free each and every week so i really appreciate that all right let's get started on this training because i've got so much to cover this type of application you can create any type of scheduling application so you can create this customize it for your clients sell these Either way, this is a really great foundation because we're going to not only be able to show you how to scheduling, how to avoid conflicts, how to create a drag and drop scheduler, how to add pictures of your staff in there, how to set things up so you have a dynamic setup screen so you can show what you want to show on those drag and drop, but simply by selecting or unselecting that, having a dynamic start time, intervals, a booking type like chair or bed or room or something like that it could be anything. And also we can have uh, dynamic of course rooms or chairs whatever you want on here so if I were to change this to a room if you want to book a room this is gonna change room all you need to do is just change them down here so very very dynamic application and that is the key here customizable tax figures a lot to show you so this is there's a lot of foundational principles that I'm gonna teach you in here even if you don't want to create your own spa and salon manager the things that you're gonna learn in here the scheduling the invoicing the formulas that make the drive drag and drop, the editing, everything is going to be really, really foundational so that you're able to create your own applications regardless of what they might be. And then, of course, sell them for passive income. That is my goal here. That is why not just to teach you Excel, but to make you successful with Excel. This application simply is a drag and drop schedule. If we're to drag and drop, it's going to move that appointment, update the stats and everything like that. You'll be able to edit the idea. It can change the the primary service, if you have different services, and out save and update that. Colors are dependent based on service. And that means when you have service items, you create different service items, we can also assign a color to that. So we can assign a different color. And so for each, let's say we style 24 or cut and style, or whatever service you're providing, you can assign a color to that. If we were to assign a color to orange, that color is going to be reflected inside the appointments. We'll be able to navigate based on the days. And we'll also be able to show you a lot how to do that. Also be able to add brand new appointments over here. And I'm going to show you how to create this custom background. We'll be able to show you then how to edit it just a one click to edit that appointment, unhiding some rows to allow us to edit that. And also creating a one click invoice where a single click is going to allow us to create an invoice for that. So a, a lot to cover. I cannot wait to share that with you. So we're going to get started right away. Let's go over a little bit of an overview of what we have in this application. Well, obviously, if we're going to be working on clients, we need a client list, right? So we have a client clients, customers, all the same thing. We're calling them clients this time, but it's really the same thing. And we just have a list. We've got a client ID, a name, an address, city and state. That's going to appear on the invoice zip, phone number and email if you need. All right. Along with that, we also have a setup screen, as I showed you briefly before. The setup screen pretty much it has the ability to uh, create customized uh, user experiences. So we want to know what if their start time is nine? What if it's seven o'clock? Right. And that's really helpful because we can start it earlier or later or however you want. And it's going to be based on those times, those intervals. So it's based on whatever times you want to set up in your application. OK, so we also have intervals. Maybe you want those intervals every 30 minutes. Right, So we can set that and as soon as we do that and we refresh the schedule, it's going to update automatically on 
the schedule. So now you see those appointments are all condensed right there every 30 minutes. So these are shape based and they work really, really well with that kind of interval. So we can customize the schedule any way we want it. All right. So back in the schedule, we'll set this back to 15 minute intervals is what we had it, but it's very customizable. We have uh, then again, our customized, right? If we were to change this to, let's say room one, that's going to go ahead and change on the schedule. So we now we see we've got room. These are basically using formulas that we're going to go over. So it's very customizable in that way. And of course, also we have now the room one is available in the drop down list as we add those things to the appointments, right? So whether even if you're using meeting rooms or anything like that, we, there's a lot of things that you can do with this. Any type of scheduling application can benefit from this kind of application. Okay, so we'll go ahead and set that back to chair one, of course you can call it anything. Um, our sample today is going to be with a, a salon. So we also have the durations, right? How long are those appointments? These durations are going to be based on our intervals. So if I set five minute intervals, I may want five minute durations, right? If I set it back to 15, we're gonna have 15 minute durations and interval, intervals within 15 minutes, 15 to 30. So that's all based on some formulas. Okay, so we also have an appointments, right? An appointments table. Now this is simply where all those appointments are stored. We have an appointment ID, a client name, a date, the date scheduled, the start time, what time is the appointment started, how long will that appointment go for, and along with the end time, I want to know the staff who's been scheduled on that. What we're going to call this booking type, but it's also known as chair. Notice this is also based on the booking type. So if your booking type is room or bed or whatever it is, it's going to appear here. So we're going to call this booking type for our purposes. Okay, so once we have the booking type, we also want to make sure that we have the primary service. What is the service that we're going to offer our customers? Right. We also want a secondary service. Maybe they want two different services. So we can put up to two in this application. Of course, if you could create this, you can add many more if you like. Okay. Also, what I want to know is some notes, perhaps some notes we're going to put on that. So that's all based on the information that's entered here inside for each appointment. When we save an appointment, those lines hide, and we also have a nice, beautiful schedule that we can see. We can also see that our staff pictures are displayed. So when we go into our service items here, we have an item ID. These are the service items. These are the service items that we're going to be choosing when we add a particular appointment. It is a, this list of service items here and this list of service items here. The same list of service items that we have here. We also have a description. This item description will appear on invoices. The duration, what is the default duration, right? This is very easy when we uh, create it, if we create a, add a new appointment and we decide that we're going to give it a specific, let's say a primary service of wash and dry, we want to know what the duration is of that. What is the default duration of that? So that way we can simply add a service and then we know the default duration. So that's why it's helpful to add that duration. I want to know a color. We're going to show you how to create this little pop-up color that automatically changes based on you know, style. The cost of it, the, we're not going to use this too much, but I put the column in there because it might help you understand when we create these invoices, what is the overall cost of that? And then a price that's going to get transferred over to the invoice. We also have a staff list here, just basically an employee ID, a phone number, email. We're not going to use too much of this really. And, but I just kept it there large. And, but most importantly, we are going to use this staff picture. Now that staff picture have to be, I, I get a lot of questions. Hey, how come my pictures don't show up, right? Make sure you watch these trainings. Of course, that's first. And remember this staff picture here, this is just a picture name, right? The only way that we can insert a picture as you, because when you get this application, you download it, you're not going to be able to see these staff pictures. Why is that? Because you have to set your folder. This is where my picture folder is located right here. So when you combine this folder path, for me, it is this location right here. When I combine this folder path and I make that combination with this file name picture here inside our staff with this picture name, the combination of that path will create the full file path of the picture. I can then load that in. So make sure when you watch these videos and you understand that that's why if you're not seeing them, we, you know, a lot of people get this and they say, hey, the pictures aren't showing up. Well, that is because we have to make sure that we create that full file path. And then, of course, on our Patreon platform, if you want these pictures on our Patreon platform, I provide all the icons. I provide all the employee pictures. All the resources associated with every training is available on our Patreon platform. So I hope you'll join us there. All right, so we have our staff and we also have the invoice. What is an invoice screen? All the service items. We have our client. 
we have our description of that service item, the quantity, the cost, and the total. We can save new invoices, we can load in invoices, we can um, update it and save and load it. So it's really, really helpful. We can create an invoice in just one click based on that schedule. So when I click on a specific appointment here and I click this little dollar sign right here, it is automatically going to create that invoice. If I save that invoices, it's automatically going to be saved. I'm gonna walk you through that. We have an invoice list. This is the list of the invoices. I just created all these invoices here. The date of that, we probably don't need the time there. That's just a format. Let's go ahead and update that. That format should be a short date format. Okay, so we've got a date, the customer, the staff that's associated. The staff is also brought over from the schedule, right? So if we have a, a staff of Greg Perkins, right, and we create an invoice for that, it is that staff that's going to be brought over into this. So it's gonna be brought directly over and the total there. We also have an invoice item. These are the individual items from every particular invoice. I just created invoice number four. That invoice had two items and the invoice item name description. We have the quantity, the price, and the row associated with the invoice. Notice this is nine and 10. If we look back on the invoice, we see that this is row nine and row 10. So we need to know what, when we need to load that up, if I wanna load, let's say I'm gonna load one up and then I wanna load four up, that's the one we just created. I need to know that they need to come back to row nine and come back to row 10. So I'm gonna show you how we do that to make sure. I also need to know what database they were saved on, that's 11 and 12. Notice we also have in our invoice item 11 and 12. That is the row 11, row 12. We need to know what row they're saved on. So great, that's pretty much it. That's the foundation of this application. That's everything that all we need to do to build it. So how let's get into the intricacies and see exactly how we did that. Of course, I want to take you a little bit through the setup screen. We went over, but I just want to go over some of the named range that we've created. Those named ranges are going to help us go on. We have a start time. This is the start time. I'll probably, probably create this earlier in 11 if we go into the data validation data validation and we see that this is based on the times right so this is based on all of these times associated here every time that we associate here so we can create that i will probably make an update so we can add additional features we can create that based on maybe a time in the setup screen a list of times so that can be customized okay so keep that in mind that's just based on that and also what we have is we have an interval of 15 minutes five minutes and but what i really want is not this interval five minutes or 10 minutes what I really want is I want the number, the decimal number that's associated with 15 minutes, which is this. Now, how do we get that? Well, we're gonna use these intervals. I set up this little table. Now you've seen this, you may have seen this before in other applications that I've created. So basically, I want to associate a decimal with a specific amount of time. How do we get to these? Well, if we know that in Excel, one day is one, right? So if I wanna know how many, what is the decimal associated with one hour, all I would need to do is do equal one divided by 24 and that is going to give us that 0 0.04167 now what if I want to know the 30 minutes well I would just simply divide that by 2 and that is going to give us let's try that again equals this divided by 2 that is going to give us our 30 minute intervals and I just keep doing the division you know dividing it by 2 right and then this would be 6 in one hour 10 minutes is 6 so I divide that by 6 as you can see right here 1 divided by 24 divided by six. So what I want is the decimal that's associated. This every five minutes is one divided by, and then 12 because there are 12 five minute intervals inside a single hour. That is going to give us this time right here. These decimals because times in Excel are based on numbers or decimals. Anything less than one day is gonna be a decimal. So what I want to do is I want to determine what this 15 minutes is. What is the interval that's associated with this 15 minutes? How can I do that? Well, I can use that with an index. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna index all of these intervals here, G, and then what I'm going to do is I want to return a match based on C4, what's in C4? That's what they've selected here. Let's go into this one here. So you can see C4, it's gonna look for C4, and it's gonna look for it here. Once it's found, it's gonna return the decimal associated that using a match located in column F. So basically we are going to return point zero one zero four that is the one associated for 15 minutes it is this one that i've called a name range called interval interval that's the named range so when i create these durations here all i need to do is say equals interval and then all i need to do is just equal whatever's above 
plus the interval. Now, the difference here in this list is, is the formatting. If we look into the home and we go into the custom, which is art, we see that this has been formatted. Still the same decimal number, but this has been formatted with this custom H colon MM. That is a custom format. That's how we get this duration. I don't want times. I just want the duration shown in hours. So that's how we get this. But it's also, right, if we were to change that to general, we would see that it's still that decimal that's showing up. It's just based on the format that we set it up. Okay, so that's going to give us our duration, our list of durations. It is this that we created a named range. So inside the formula, name manager, all the way at the top, duration here. Let's take a look down here. Here we go. Duration here, that is going to be basically the setup, everything that's going to be based in this column. So that's all the durations we have. So we've created a name range called duration. So it is this same duration that we're going to use directly inside here. When we look in the data validation here, and data validation, you see it's duration. So that's how we get that duration. Our times, it's a data validation, of course, based on that time. So we already saw that. That's going to be equal to times. That's going to be based on this time. So continuing on with the setup screen. So we understand that. And then we understand the picture folder. I also want to know inside the invoicing, are we going to be charging sales tax or not? So if we are, then we need to make sure that we are, if it's yes or no, I want to base this dynamic. And if so, what is the percentage? So if it's no, on those invoices, I don't want to show any sales tax. However, if we do say yes, and I want to, and we do set a tax on the invoices, I then want to show the tax amount and show the tax information. So that's of course dynamic as well. All right, so that's pretty much it for the setup screen. And then we have our dynamic. Remember, this here is going to be based on the booking type, plus I'm going to add an S to it. So if I put um, room here, or if I put bed here, or if I put any you know, stall or anything like that, it's going to just be plural here. So for example, just change room here, it's going to be room. So that gives the user a little bit of uh, information on what to put in this column. So that is all your information there. That's how we're going to call that the booking type. What type of room? What type of chair are we booking? What type of, you know, what do we need? Okay, so that's it for the setup screen. Relatively simple not much going on here you can add to that of course there's a lot more you might want to do with that but that's all clients is relatively simple it's just the table inside the scheduling we have some information here that's going to help us moving forward because we've got also some named ranges and some formulas here located in columns a and b let's go over some of the basic named ranges so we can get that out of the way so I want to make sure that we understand. So we have an appointment booking type. Now the appointment booking type is based on the AP. So we have appointments. We've got several named ranges and they're all dynamic named range using the offset. We've got one for booking type. This is going to be booking type. Remember it says chair again. We're using a formula on that header based on the booking type. We have the appointment date here. We have the appointment end, right? I want to know the end time. We have the appointment ID, also very important. Let's just close this out. No, I don't want to save the changes. And I'm going to go back into the appointments. Let's continue on so it doesn't keep switching screens here. So we also have the staff that's associated with that. That's going to be really important because I'm going to need to know are, are there conflicts? Are there staff comps? So I've created a different named range. Now a lot of you have asked me, Randy, why don't you just use tables because the named ranges are created automatically? I really like, I'm very, very picky and specific about how I create this named ranges and what they look like. So I really wanted things to look the way I, you know, because when I put these in formulas, it's very easy to read and they're very short formulas and they're very easy to read. And so I just like to have my own that way. But of course, if you're comfortable with using tables and you enjoy using tables and they're, they're good, great. You know, that's, that's as long as it works for you, that's fine, right? I'm just showing you an alternative way. It may or may not be better for you, but I'm really, I really like to work with these ranges. I fi I find that table are limiting so we have an appointment start tape and then back into the booking type we've got booking type i showed you that already so we've got that inside there let's go back inside our service items we've got a few we've got item id also a named range okay and item name right item name also a named range we can assume they're all based on offset and that's going to be based on this item name right here so we went over that so it's called item name data validation we've got two fields that are associated with this called service name service name we're using okay service name and that's going to be the same for both the primary and the secondary and then just some notes field there so what else do we have well we have a few others but we'll get into them as we need them so we don't go over all the name ranges so i've got a client appointment date appointment time duration 
And I also want to know what is the selected appointment ID. Remember, each individual appointment has a selected ID. That's how we can keep track of them. And when we select a specific appointment, I want the ID of that to appear right here. I want the ID, whatever that ID is appear. Then I also want to know what row is associated with that appointment. If we appointment, uh, for example, if it's appointment ID number three, it's, a, it's row number six. Our first one starts in row four. So keep that in mind. So to do that, what we're going to use, we're going to use a match. And we're going to base it on a named range called appointment ID. Whatever's in B2, I'm going to run a match. And if it's, there's a match that's found, I'm going to add three onto that, right? Because our first one starts in four. If there's no match, we're going to show a blank. That is going to get us the row number. And that's how if we add a new one, right, let's move over here. Maybe we should move that button over. It's a little bit farther over here. A little bit too far to the left here, so we can't see it. Okay, so if we add a new appointment here, that's going to go blank because everything's right. There's no longer, we've cleared out the appointment ID in B2. Now it cannot find an appointment ID, therefore it's showing blank, right? It's a brand new one. We've got some required fields. If I try to save this, of course, it's going to let us know we've got required fields. And I also want to know the next appointment ID. The next appointment ID, if we take a look inside appointments, all of our appointment IDs are numerical. The next one would be 15. We can use that. If you've seen my videos before, we use the max formula, max of all the appointment IDs plus one. If there's an error, why would there be an error? Well, there'd be an error if there's no data at all. Then I want to revert back to the first available, which would be one, the first ID. Then what I want to know is the end time. What is the end time? I want to calculate. And if you'll notice here on a select employee, we've got a we've got a appointment time and we've got a duration, but there's no end time here. But I really want to save that end time. And that's going to be important when we determine if there's conflicts. Is there is the staff occupied at the same time? Or is the current booking type, in this case chair, is the chair occupied, right? If I try to move this right over the top of this one, it's going to let me know, hey, this chair is already occupied for this time. Please select another time. So we got to select another time. You know, we can't do that, right? Because that chair is occupied. So I need to know that we're going to use a formula for that. We need to know if there's conflicts. So again, that's really, really important. And we can do the same thing with staffs. So what I want to do is I want to know an end time. And I want to save this end time inside the appointments database. So I want to save it right here. But to do that, what I want to make sure is that we don't necessarily need an end time. We don't need the user to enter the end time. All we need is the appointment time and the duration. The end time can be calculated, and it is simply that. It is simply the appointment time plus the duration, right? Plus the duration. That's going to get us our appointment time. So to figure that out, we can do equals, right? 8 a.m. plus one hour. Just entering that's going to give us that end time. And if we format it based on the time, it's going to be like that. That's all we need to do. Because what I want to do is I want to figure out, hey, is there a conflict, right? Is there is that chair occupied from the appointment time, from the beginning time to the end time? So end time is a critical component of that. Okay, so then what I want to know is I want to know uh, that have all of the required fields been filled in? When I click Add New, I have look six fields that are required. If I try to save it, I need to know, hey, all of these point, the fields are not filled in. Let the user know that these fields need to be filled in. The best way to do that, if we could do if D is blank or F is blank or H is blank, it's a lot more complex in or just more time consuming and more code writing. But however, if we can just create a uh, specific formula that is going to let us know how many of those required fields are have been filled in so we can use that right here required fields well all we need to do is just use count a based on all of the required fields if that is less than six which then we know that we need to let the user know that all the required fields have not been filled in so when we select appointment we see that now six have been filled in so we know that we could save this those required fields so we will make a check inside the code if b6 is less than six then let the user know that all the fields have not been filled in so to put that i also want to know is there a conflict right is there a conflict between the chair we'll call it chair now notice this is dynamic it's booking type and conflict so if you change it to room it's going to say room conflict which is kind of helpful Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, what I need to know is I need to simply add up, and we're going to use some product for that. And we're going to use some named ranges inside that. So let's take a look, quick look at these named ranges just to double check before we go into that. I want to remind you as we use it. So we have appointment staff. Appointment staff is all the staff associated. Appointment start is all the start times. Appointment 
and here's all the end times. This is where that end time is going to play into it. And also we have the appointment date. So we're going to need all of those things. The first conflict that we're going to check for is we need to know if there's a conflict. And I need to know if I try to take this appointment here and I try to drag it over right in the middle of this one, it's going to let us know, hey, this chair is already occupied for this time. Please select another time or chair. Right? And so we have to then just change that to chair two or change it to another chair and save those to make sure that it gets changed back. Okay, So keep that in mind. Of course, we can move it before, which is not a problem. right? So that same, but it's just the so we have a chair conflict. So when there is a chair conflict, we need to let the user know. And we could do that with this formula right here. If this particular number here is greater than one, greater than one, that means there's a conflict. How can we do that? Well, we're going to use some product for that. Right? I need to know if there is more than one count of the following. If the appointment date is equal to F2. Right. So that's our appointment date. F2 is located right here inside our appointment date here. Then also what I need to know is I need to know if also the start date is less than or equal to H2. If the start date and if the end date is greater than or equal to H2 and if the appointment booking type is equal to F3. So if all of those instances, so what I basically want to do is I want to count all of the instances when all of those conditions are true. It's just one right now, right? Just this appointment. But if it's more than one, what I want to do is I want to let the user know. The first thing what I want to do is I want to add some conditional formatting onto here to let the user know, as you saw, there was a problem, right? When we moved it down here, take a look at this. All of a sudden, this number became two. Now there's two appointments that occupy that time slot. They're on top of each other, right? So we also want to add some conditional formatting in here. So when we go into the conditional formatting and manage rules, it's a very simple conditional formatting. And we're going to edit the rule. When B7 is greater than one, I want to give it this red background with red font. So they'll let the user know that there is a conflict. As soon as they make that change and then save those changes, the conflict is gone. So that is what we call a chair conflict or a booking type conflict. We have another type of conflict, right? We also want to know is the same particular staff, does the same staff have a conflict? Are they occupied at that time? We have a staff conflict, right? If the same staff is also going to be doing the same thing, if we take a look in here, we see Kay Hopkins on this one, you see there's a conflict all the way over here on the right here in chair seven, there's also K. So take a look at this. K has an overlapping time, right? So we, we see that there's a, an issue and it's going to let us know. If I move this down where she has availability here, we'll see that that conflict now we're going to click on that and click on the edit there and we see that that conflict is gone. So we see that K here and here there's no longer a conflict. And we do exactly the same thing on the staff conflict. The only difference is appointment date, appointment start, and appointment end are all the same. The only difference is this time we're counting the staff based on what's in D3. That's going to let us know if there's any conflict. So if there's any more than when all those situations are true, if there's any more than one, it's going to put two. And that's also going to put a conditional formatting here, just as like one. Basically, the red background and the red font if this B8 is greater than one. So that's how, and also when we run the macro and we save it, we're simply going to check. If this is greater than one, then we need to let the user know that there is a conflict and to let them fix that. Okay, great, so we understand that staff conflicts. We also wanna know for drag and drop, when I select on something, I wanna know if there's been a move, right? This is gonna tell us if it's been a move and this will go to false true and then false and then back to true again okay so that's going to let us know here i'll show you a little bit more about that also we have a left position when i select a shape i have a left position and i have a top position of that shape right here i need to know as we select on something is there a change to this left position or is there a change to this top position so as we move something i need to know that timer is going to run and if it's been moved if the left position or if the top position has been changed, then we need to know the user has made a move. So that's all we have to do. And then also I want to know, has an invoice been an invoice been created for this? If so, place that invoice right here. So if you see not all of them, for example, this one, this particular appointment, appointment ID 10, no invoice has been created. So for, therefore the invoice has been row. If an invoice has been created, when I select on this icon, I want to go directly to that invoice invoice right 
which is right here, invoice number one. If it has not been created, I want to go create a brand new invoice. So either we're going to go to an existing invoice or we're going to go to a new invoice. And it's all going to be based on this right here. That's how we know. And all we're going to do in this formula is simply we're going to match an invoice appointment ID. Now that invoice appointment ID, if we go to this invoice list, we have invoice ID. And then we have the appointment ID that's associated. I'll make sure this is updated. We don't want to have different, uh, <laughs> make sure that's set that correct. I think it's incorrect there. I want to make sure that we know the appointment ID that's been associated with each one of these. Okay, so we'll be going over that code. I'll double check that. They shouldn't all be ones. All right, so as we move through that, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we know the difference between something that's been invoiced and not. Okay, so that's, that's the reason for you have this. That is it. That's all for the ad. Admin. Then here we have a sample shape. When we create these shapes, we need to start out with a sample. And that's this sample shape right here. And it is called, there's a name for that. That's called uh, right here, uh, sample at back, sample at back. I also have a sample shape for the picture. If we're going to be displaying staff pictures, that's going to be called staff sample staff picture. So we're going to duplicate that. And then inside this, we're going to fill it with a picture. Just as if we right click, let's move that over here so you can see it. Just as if we right click that, and then we format the shape. And then what we do is we want to give it a solid fill. But in this case, it's going to be a picture fill, right? A picture. So we click picture, not solid, but picture text. And then we click file and we would browse for the file. So that's how we're going to be doing it, except we're going to do that with VBA. VBA, we're going to use that full file path that we discussed before. We're going to fill that circle with that. So for now, we'll just have no fill, which is fine on the sample. And so that's going to allow us to put the staff picture directly in there. So we have those as a sample. These get created automatically. Okay, so let's get into VBA and let's start focus on these appointments. How do we save these appointments? How do we load them? How do we clear it out for a brand new appointment? And we can do that with just these three buttons here. And of course, we have delete button, delete appointment as well. So let's go over how we do that now. All right, inside the VBA here, and I've got uh, Alt F11 is a shortcut we'll get you there. I've got a module called appointment macros. Appointment macros. We'll start up at the top of this. We've got some variables that we're going to defend an appointment row, appointment column, the last row, and the last results row. We're going to use these throughout this module. First one is going to be the save and update, right? The save and update. That is the macro that's going to run whether we're saving an existing one or whether we're, whether we're updating an existing one or whether we're saving a new appointment. It is the same macro that we're going to go through both. Now, to differentiate between those two, we know that if there's no appointment ID, if we click Add New and there is no ID and there is no row associated with it, we know it's going to be a new one. So we can use that to differentiate. But first, before we do that, we need to make sure that when they're saving it, that we have at least all the requirements filled out. If this, B6, is not 6 or is less than 6, we let the user know. We can do that with some code here. If B6 is less than 6, then please make sure to fill in all the required fields before saving an appointment. And so if I try to save this, we're going to get that message saying, please make sure to fill all the required fields. Okay, so we want to make sure that we have a client. We want to make sure that we have an appointment date. We'll do the same date that we're working on. We always want to have an appointment time. We see the chair one is available. And we can put an appointment time here all the way up here, probably 830. And then a duration. We can set our duration here. We can set the staff. We want to make sure that it is a staff that is not currently busy. So let's say Hank is not busy. And we have chair one that we're going to set up. And we'll set up a primary service. So when I save it, I want to save that information. It is brand new. We know it because there's no row associated. So inside the appointments, we want to create a brand new one, appointment ID. All of that information gets saved here. Now, the best way to do that is to use data mapping. And so if we take a look inside this upper row, this row number one, we see that we have specific fields, cells that are matched. As D2 is our client. So when we look back on here on our scheduling screen, we see that D2 is associated with the client. The appointment date is F2. So back in our appointments, F2. So we've matched all the data. 
That way, all we need to do is run a loop from 2 to 11. Appointment ID will already be there, and we're going to bring in all the information from the scheduling and put it on the first available row for new appointments. And that's just what we're going to do here, and it's going to be all based on that. But the first thing what we need to do is get that next available appointment ID. That next available appointment ID is going to come directly from B4 using the max. We're going to take this uh, next appointment, and we're going to place it directly in B2, and we're going to place it directly inside A18, and we're going to do that right here. So if B3 is empty, then it's a new appointment, right? We're going to take the appointment row. It's going to be that first available row inside the database using end XLF plus one. That is our first available row. Again, you can take what is in B4 and place it directly in B2. That is going to take that next appointment ID, which is currently in B4, and place it in B2. We're going to take that same one and place it directly inside the appointments. And that's what the next line of code is. Appointment database, column A and the appointment row, is going to take on that next appointment ID. But what if it's an existing? Well, if it's an existing, it's very simple. All we need to do in this case is determine the appointment row that's based on B3. Once we have all that, we can run our loop for data management mapping. This is our data mapping. Our appointment ID in column one has already been taken care of here or an existing is already there. So all we need to run a loop from two to 11. And all we're going to do is the appointments database. This is this appointment database is the code name right here. So if we take a look inside our appointment database right here, it's the appointment database. That is the code name, sheet code name we're using. Cells, we're using cells because both the row and the column are dynamic variables. Value equals. Now we need to get that range. Where is that range located? That D2 or F2? It's located here in row one and the column. That column's moving from two to 11. So we're gonna take that range, whatever's in dot range, remember we're on the schedule dot range, whatever's in D2, we're gonna place it directly here, whatever's in F2 as we loop through all the columns. This is gonna map and bring all that data in there. Then what I wanna do is I wanna set the appointment move B9 to true. We'll go over why that's important a little bit later on, but that prevents loops, right? When I save an appointment, if there's a loop going on, uh, the, the loop happens as soon as we select it, there's a loop that's kind of waiting for us to move. It's waiting and waiting. If we move it, great. It's going to end that loop there. But as soon as it doesn't, right, so we want to make sure if we take a look inside B9, we see that that's going to go from true to false and then back to true. All right, so let's continue on with our code. So now that we have, so we have check for conflicts. Now what I want to do is I want to check for conflicts, right? So let's go back in here and we see if there's a conflict. I want to know if B7 is more than one, then there is a conflict, right? If I take chair two here and I and I change it to chair three, there's going to be a conflict. If I save it, we're going to all of a sudden we're going to have a conflict, right? Now B7 is more than one. Now there's a conflict. Now we've got two appointments on top of each other. So that's what we say. If B7 value is greater than one, there's a booking type conflict. Let the user know this is this, and then booking type, right, this is the dynamic field, is already occupied for this time. Please select another time or booking type, right? So it's instead of saying booking type, when we try to save it, we're gonna see here this chair, notice now it says chair because it's that dynamic variable we're using, is already occupied for this time. Please select another time or chair. So as soon as we save one to a different time, right, let's click on here, this one here, as soon as we save that to, let's say back to chair one, we are going to be able to save it. There we go. So now it's going to save back to there and it's going to, the, the conflict is gone. Okay, we're going to do exactly the same thing for staff conflict. If we have two staff, as I mentioned before, we're going to check that here. B8 is greater than one, then we have a staff conflict. We're going to let them know that D3, the staff name, is already occupied for this time. Please select another time or staff. And then what I want to do is once I've saved it, we want to hide the rows, perhaps, right? Once we save it, we don't, we no longer need to show these rows. We're done saving this appointment. So when I save it, I want those rows from row two to four, uh, rows two to four to be hidden. And I also want to make sure that a group of shapes, this group of shapes right here, the save appointment delete, I want this group to be hidden too. And the name of this shape here is called existing appointment group, existing appointment group. So it is that that I also want to hide. So we're gonna hide those rows from two to four, entire row hidden equals true, and that existing appointment group 
hidden false. I want to hide that group of shapes and I'm going to select just another cell. Okay, so that's it. That's all we have to do. When it comes to a new appointment, all I need to do is clear out a bunch of associated fields, right? Including B2, especially B2. We want to make sure that when we select a new B2, that selected appointment ID is automatically cleared. So when we click add appointment, all of those associated fields are cleared along with B2. That's going to make sure that there's no longer a row associated with it because it's been cleared out. And I also want to make sure that we're going to select D2. That is going to make sure that the user can now enter a client. And we'll want to make sure that the entire row from two to four, those rows are no longer hidden. And I want to make sure those button shapes, the existing appointment group, is now visible. So that's all we have to do when we click the Add New button. So we're going to make sure that those rows are visible. We're going to make sure that this group of shapes is displayed. And then we're going to make sure that we've selected D2. That's all we have to do for the new appointments. Now, when we load an appointment, how do we load an appointment? Well, there's a macro that's associated with this. When I select here, or I select Edit here, I want to load an appointment, right? And that's the best way to do it. Selecting here is going to load that appointment loading all those details. That is a macro that has been assigned to this group here. If we take a look at the button here, and we right click and we click assign macro, we see that it's called appointment load. That is the macro that we're going to go over now. When we do that macro, we need to make sure that we also clear any check for any loops. We want to make sure that there's no loops. That's going to come in handy. So we're going to clear out. That's just what it's going to do is going to basically stop the timer. There's a timer that's running right now. It's going to stop that timer timer and this is going to go to true as soon as it goes to true it stops the timer we'll go into that macro but keep that in mind it simply stops waiting for user it's waiting for user to see if they're going to move it if they're going to drag and drop it that timer gets stopped when we're ready to edit those appointments and that's what we bring b9 to true okay i want to make sure that the rows are visible hidden equals false and i want to make sure that existing group is changed when i'm loading it i want to make sure that's displayed if B3 is empty, we want to make sure that we want to select B3 is required. B3 is the row that's associated with this. So we can't do anything unless we have a row. So that just ensures that we have the row. Okay, so assuming that we do have it, we want to let the user know to, if it's empty, let the user know to please select an appointment to view. All right, so assuming that it's not, what we want to do is appointment load. This way, appointment row is equal to whatever's in B3. I need that row so I know what row to load from our database. That row is located in B3. Once I have that row, I'm going to load from 2 to 11, but not every single column. Keep that in mind. If When I load that data, remember I'm loading an end time. That end time is going to go directly inside this column here. However, I do not want this end time to come back into the schedule. Why is that? Because that's a formula. You saw that that was gone for a moment earlier on, and that was simply because I forgot to do something. And I'll show you what it is because you'll probably forget too. I forgot to make sure that column six does not get in. Why column six? If we take a look at all these columns, one, this is column six. So when we're loading, if I'm bringing in the, the client name, the date, the start time, the duration, I don't want to bring in the end time. Why? Because the end time's automatic. It's automatically created based on the start time, based on the duration. So it's a formula. I don't want to erase that formula. This formula here, I don't want to erase. I want to keep it there because this formula is based on. So as soon as we have an appointment time and a duration, this is going to show the end time. So that is column six. So inside our code, we want to load all of the information from the database here, from whatever row, whatever the cell is, remember the cell D2, F2, is going to be located in row one. So we're going to take that and we're going to say this range is equal to whatever the appointment row and the appointment column is. And I want to bring it all in except for when we get to column six. If the appointment column does not equal six, then load it in. If it's six, don't do anything because that's a formula. We don't want to erase that. So it's going to load all the data. And then all I want to do is simply select a cell. That's it for load. Okay, well, what about appointment delete? If I want to delete it, I didn't assign this macro to the button, but we'll do that now. So first of all, we want to give the user, are you sure you want to delete this appointment? Yes, no, delete appointment. 
If it's no, then exit the sub, and that basically gives the user an option to exit out. Focusing on the schedule, if B3 is empty, remember, we need a row associated with that appointment. If it's empty, then we're going to let the user know to select an appointment view and we're exiting out. We cannot delete any row if we don't have it. So assuming that we do, we're going to set that appointment row based on B3. And then what we're going to do is simply delete that row from the appointment database using appointment database range, appointment row, and this colon, and appointment row, the entire row delete. Then we're going to run the macro that's going to new, that's going to clear everything out. So when we go ahead and assign this here, right click here, and I actually have to run to refresh the schedule too. So we want to click on both of those icons, right clicking on here, assign that macro, and of course we can do appointment delete or paste in, clicking OK. Now when I select an appointment here, and also what I want to do is I want to add one more thing. I want to refresh that schedule, right? Not only appointment new, but I want to remove it. If it's visible on the schedule, we want to refresh the schedule. So that's the macro we're going to be going over next, but it is going to be based on the schedule macros, and it's called schedule refresh. So I want to refresh that schedule. We'll be going over this macro, and I'm going to copy this. And then what I'm going to do inside the appointment, and then appointment after the new, I'm going to paste that in here, which is going to refresh the schedule. So now if I take an appointment, here and I want to delete it first we're going to get the option are you sure you want to delete this appointment if yes it's going to refresh the schedule and now you're going to make sure please make sure to fill in the required okay we'll update that so that's it so now you see it's gone and we're good to go on that so that's all we have to do there okay on the schedule refresh so appointment new and then schedule refresh great so we've covered all of the appointment macros now let's go over we're going to skip the invoice we're going over that and i want to focus on well, let's do service macros there's just a few that's pretty much pretty simple there so we'll go over that now so if you'll notice if you remember correctly on the service when we have just a small macro when we create a cell i should probably have this only when we have a value here in other words we really don't need this appearing here so i'm going to update that that's going to be on selection change so let's take a look inside our service items sheet under the selection change so inside service items selection change if the user makes a selection change i'm going to add something to this right notice how this appeared even when we have no data, which really probably isn't very good, right? What I really want to do is I want to check to make sure that A does not equal empty, you know, or B does not equal empty. Only then do we want to display that. So let's do that right now. So if E3, if the user makes a selection from E3, and the first thing we'll start at the top. If we're going to select a large amount of cells, we want to exit out of the sub. So we're really focused on selecting one cell at a time. Also, if for any reason we make a selection on any cell, I want that group, this group of shapes, all it is is simply a group of shapes. Now this looks very, if you follow one of my prior trainings, we used this shape just a few weeks ago. And so it's the same shape. All we're doing is giving it a specific name as a group of rectangles, each with its own format, each with its own name. This one's called style 22. This one's called style 23 and so on and so forth. Now these styles are very specific to the styles that go. So when we click on form, format and we have a shape these are the styles that get. this is style 22 if we take a look at this one we see that this one is actually style there's specific styles that are associated with this okay so it is those styles that we're going to be using and so they're the name so it's really the number that we really want associated 22 23 and i'll show you what that is when we get into the code but basically i've signed a name i've grouped all these shapes and i've given it a name called color group if i select something i want that group to be hidden only if i select associated column in column e do i want it to show up so if it's currently visible then hide it using shapes color group visible equals false so if the user makes a selection on e and i'm going to add something here and range okay we also want to make sure let's say a and the target dot row dot value does not equal empty then do we want to display that color group so now when I select here, nothing's going to happen. Only when A contains a value is something going to happen. So what do we want to do? We're going to focus on this color shape. I want to make the top position, the active cell, offset. I mean, one row down and no columns to the left or right. One row down. That's where I want to place it. I want to place it directly, not in there, but one row down. Notice it's one row down. And as far as the left position, I want to make sure it's on the active cell left. And then the last thing is I want to make sure it's displayed. That is all we have to do to display that color group. 
Okay, so inside, I guess we probably don't need an entire mod. We don't probably don't need an entire module just for this code. But if you want to build out your code, it's probably necessary. Okay, what I've done is I've assigned a macro to the every shape, a single macro to every shape in this group. If you right click the group and you click assign macro, you're not going to be able to find it. However, if you right click here and you say, you, if you assign a macro, let's go ahead and assign it, assign that macro. And we see down here called service set color. When you assign that macro and you go back in and you look, it's not there. Why is that the case? Why is it not showing up? Because it's been assigned to every shape inside the group. So when I right click a specific shape in the group, you can then see the macro. Now when we click assign macro, we see that service set color. So it is this side macro. All I need to do is determine the active cell value equals the application color. That's it. Basically, what I want to do is I want to take the name of that shape, the name of that shape, and I want to put it directly inside here. That's all. It's very, very simple. All I want to do is take the name of that shape. So if the name of this shape is called Style 25. When I click that, all I want to do is put Style 25 directly in here, just like that. That's it. And then the last thing I want to do is just make sure that it, that group is no longer visible. So Act Shape MSO False. That's it. That's all I have to do probably not warranted an entire module for just four lines of code but okay fair enough okay so let's go into the schedule macros now okay so now all of the things that we've been working on the schedule and how we do it now of course once we get into that once we understand these colors how they will actually apply to the individual shapes for our schedule based on those service types so that color wash and dry if we look at wash and dry the one i've just clicked here it is based on that blue color so when we go into service items and we see wash and dry here that is style 23 that is this one right here you see this blue here so that's how we get that color if i were to change it to red wash and dry and we refresh the schedule here let's go back to previous day right now wash and dry is that red color see now it's that red color so it's very very easy to change that color simply in the service items. Let's change it back to that nice blue. It looks better. So it's very, very simple, very, very quick, and very easy and fast. All right, so how are we going to do that? So let's go ahead and go start with all these variables. And basically, what we'll do is I'll define, as I go through the code, as opposed to reading you all these variables, just a whole bunch of variables, we'll go through and I'll show you those variables. So first thing what we have is appointment shape. When I refresh that schedule, when I run that macro to refresh the schedule, I need to make sure that all of these shapes are deleted, deleted. I've got my sample shapes to create new ones. First thing I want to do is delete them. So the best way to do that, if you follow my videos, is give each one a specific name. Notice each one, this is called appointment one, that group of shapes, right? This is called appointment four. So basically, it's the word appoint plus the ID of that. That's all it is. So all I need to do is check for every single shape inside the sheet that starts with that contains the word appoint and delete it. And that's what we're going to do here. So appointment shape, that's already been defined as, as a shape right here. Appointment group, we have that. Appointment shape here. Okay, we got two shapes here. We can update that. Let's bring that down. I'm going to bring it down here where I like the shapes all to be. And then uh, that'll be a little bit easier. Okay, so we've got two shapes, appointment group and appointment shape. So for each appointment shape in schedule, we're calling out the sheet and the shapes for every single. If using the in string based on the name of that shape, if it contains the word appointment, if that's greater than zero, that means it's been found in the name of the shape. Then what we want to do is delete it, simply delete it. And then we're going to just going to loop through every sheet. Make sure when you're doing that, other shapes that you want to keep don't contain the word because they're going to be deleted. Okay, then what I want to do is I want to select, hide the selected appointment group. What is that? The selected appointment group. That's based on the schedule. So if we take a look inside here, this particular, these two little icons here, oops, I clicked one by accident. This icon here, this two little icon set is called selected appointment group. It's the edit and it is the invoice icon here. These two icons, I've grouped them together and we call it selected appointment group. I want that hidden, right? I want to keep it, right? We only have one. I want to keep it, but I want to hide it. So we're going to hide it. So we're going to make MSO visible equals false. Hide the selected appointment group. 
Also, I want to clear, there's a string called appointment details. This is a string variable. I want to make sure that it is cleared. So we're going to do that. Also, I want to set the picture folder. Now, remember, this is where we, how we get that full file path for our pictures. That picture folder is located in C19. C19 is going to hold that. So what I want to do is I want to put that. Now, you notice there's no backslash on the end of that, but I'm going to add that within the code. So the picture folder is going to be based on the setup C19 and the backslash. So C19 along with the backslash, that is going to be our picture folder. We're placing that inside this variable. That is our staff name picture staff. Let's just call it staff picture folder. Okay, so that's where you're going to put. So when you get this, make sure in C19 you put your pictures there. Okay, I also want to set the start time. What is the start time based on the schedule start time? This is a named range inside the setup screen. That is the official start time. Start Okay. start time now we also have the intervals remember we we focused on this interval this name range is decimal value and we're going to put that into a long variable schedule remember we've got some long variables here duration schedule interval and schedule start time those are all long variables as excuse me they're double variables double they're not long they're double long is a whole number doubles decimal so we use double for the decimal okay so now we can focus on the appointment database and what i want to do is pretty much determine all of the appointments for a specific date. That date here is located inside D5. So I want to know, basically I want to run a filter. All of the appointments on this sheet filtered by a very specific date. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a criteria inside an advanced filter. It's going to be based on this, D5. Now keep in mind that this is a formula. This is a number. That is fine. In fact, it's better. I would have preferred not to show the date format. I like it just in the numbers because Excel will read it always as a date regardless regardless of your date format. So we want to use a formula. We like to keep it in this format. That way there's no date format issues. If we place a date uh, using VBA in this cell, we can create issues based on date format. So that this is a, a sure way to make sure that your filters work properly. Then what I want to do is I want to determine the last row, filter all of those appointments based on that one single date, in this case, December 1st, and then run a loop adding each appointment individually. So that's what we're going to do. The first thing we want to do is determine, clear out any prior results. So I'm going to clear out all the way from AA to all the way AM. Now, keep in mind, I need additional things on this, right? I've got all of my information, but what I want is an item color. But our item color, that color is located here in the service items, right? It's not located. We don't have, inside this database, we don't have the color, right? But I need to extract that color. But I, if I know my primary service, if it exists, then I can extract the color. So if I have it, all I need to do is run a formula. And then when my data is brought in here, then I just need to bring that formula down that's going to bring in the color. To get that, we can use a formula. What we're going to do is we're going to index the service color. This is the named range based on all the colors in our service. We're going to match it based on the service name. That service name is going to be located right here. And then what I want is a single column. And if there's any error, show blank. So that way, once I get my results, I'm going to determine the last row of results. Then all I have to do is take this formula and bring it down here. I also want to know the staff picture, right? If I'm going to be loading that staff picture, if I'm going to be putting that staff picture right here in the circle, I need to extract that staff circle. Again, that staff, that staff picture is not located in our appointments database. Our, that staff picture is located in our staff database, and it's located right here. So I'm going to do the same thing. I created a name range for the staff picture, and I'm going to create a formula. And that formula I'm going to place directly in AM. And the reason I don't put formulas, I don't necessarily want these formulas formulas where there's no data exists, right? I want to basically do calculation on demand only where I need it, right? So we can have VBA bring down those formulas that keeps your light, your workbook light and fast by using formulas only. So all we need to do is just clear out these formulas. So again, I'm going to use an index match on this. We're indexing the staff picture. In this case, matching the based on the staff name that's located in AG3. And then we're going to run that based on that and determining if there is a match. If it is a match, then we're going to place that name of that picture. And I want to bring it down here. And the reason that that's important is because when I create these shapes for these appointments, I want to give it a specific color. And I want to give it a, a picture. It's nice to have, it's not absolutely necessary, but it's nice to have 
all this data into one table so we can work with just this one table. So that's what we have done right here. So moving along, now we're going to get into code. So the first thing what I want to do is I want to clear out all the data from AA all the way to AM, clearing all that data out. A8 AM99, clearing any prior results, determining the last row of our original data located here based on A99. So that's going to be based on the appointment database. That's what we're focused on here. We want the last row of data. If it's less than four, we're going to exit out of the sub. Then we're going to run an advanced filter. Advanced filter is going to be based on your header row starting in A3 all the way through K. We're going to run that criteria. That criteria is going to be based on that date, P2 through P3. Then the results are going to come all the way from AA through AK. Our results are only here, right? Our formulas come after we get our results. So our results is, so that's just we have inside our advanced filter, which is here. A3 through K in the last row. Copying of the criteria range is P2 to P3. And our results are going to come from AA2 all the way into AK. Then what I want to do is I want to determine the last results row. Is it in this case, 13. If that last results row is less than three, we can exit. That means we have no data. So we can check that here, the last results row based on column AA. If it's less than three, then we're gonna exit the sub. Nothing we can do more, right? We have no data, no scheduling data. We don't need to move forward. Assuming that we do have scheduling data, then it's time to bring down those formulas. Now we know the last row. So I know in just one line of code, I can bring in all of these formulas. So we can do that with here. AL3 through AM and the last results row formula, remember it's not value, formula is equal to whatever formula is in AL1 through AM1 formula. This brings down the service type and color formula and the staff picture. Let's put and staff picture into that here. So now we have all that. So now that we have all of our data, we are ready to run our loop. Now what I want to do is simply duplicate this appointment shape here. Now notice there's been a macro that's already been assigned to this. So we don't need to use VBA. If we right click and click assign macro, we see that the appointment select, that macro's already been added. And if we click here, we see the picture of the same macro also, right? Because we don't know where the user is going to click. So it's the same macro, sorry, it's slightly off the screen here, the same macro that's been already assigned to our sample background shape and our picture circle here. So what we do is ready to run our results. So for the results row, it goes three to the last results row. I want to run a loop based on all of our results, starting at three all the way to the last row and getting all the information. So the first thing what I want to do is determine the appointment ID, in this case, a string variable. It's going to be based on AA and the results row. We also want to put in the start time based on AD, duration based on AE, and then I want to know how many rows. That's really important. If I need to know, for example, this is a one hour appointment. I need to know that this appointment is going to be based on four rows. How do I know that it's four? I know it's one hour, right? If I know it's one hour and I know that that one hour, if I divide that one hour by our intervals, I'm going to get four, right? This is based on 15 minutes. So if I know it's one hour, if I know our duration is one hour and we divide it by our interval, we are going to get four. So that's all I have to do inside the code. So our schedule row is our duration, which has been defined here, divided by our schedule interval. Our schedule interval has already been defined up here based on our interval right here. So both long, so now we have the number of rows. Our schedule rows number this is all here. This is a long variable. Duration and schedule are both double variables. So that's how we determine the number of rows. That's how it's dynamic. That means if you change the duration, the schedule interval is always going to be one hour. So let's say we decide, oh, we want our schedule interval is going to be 30 minutes right now. Our duration is still one hour, right? So that way, if you decide you want to, oh, you know what? I want to change this to 30 minutes. It doesn't mess things up. How does that happen? Because now our duration is still one hour. Our schedule interval is 30. So now our schedule rows is going to be two, right? Duration one hour divided by 30 minutes, our result's going to be two. So now we know based on this 30 minutes, right, all of a sudden when we refresh this schedule, this is going to be two rows, right? So when we go previous and next, we see now that is back one more day. So we need to see now it's based on two rows, right? So that's how we can do it. So it's very, very dynamic. We'll bring it back to 15 here, but that's how we can do it. So that's how things stay really, really fluid and flexible simply by using just a little bit of math. So we've got our duration rows. I need to know how many rows. Now I want to know the background type. That background type is going to be located 
inside our appointments located right inside here al so our booking type based on uh, that service is going to come a little bit later on so our booking type not background type booking type that's the chair or the bed or whatever here that is going to be based on ah right here so this is our booking type not background type we'll get the background type in just a bit ah booking type chair room bed etc i just don't read my own notes i should probably remember that okay our service column what is our service column now we're going to get into our color right i want to know service color not column color mm, think i need more coffee service color is going to be located in al in the result row right? i want to know what color that right style 27 23 so that we're going to put inside the variable here now i also want to know the picture name is going to come from am so that's our employee picture name now we are ready we've defined all of the variables to get all the information that we need but now what i want to do is i want to build a string if we take a look in our schedule we have this string here we've got all this information client name start date end date how do we know what to put in there well that's going to be based on users right if we decide and eh, we only want a few things i only want the client and the start date then we want to select there so now if i decide i want to refresh the schedule here now we've only got two details in here so it's dynamic based on that so what i want to do is i want to run a loop based on all the check marks if there's a check mark then i want to have that information there if not then don't so that's all we need to do so let's go previous day and next day i should probably add a refresh icon that might be helpful so so now we have all that information so what i want to do is i want to run a loop i'm going to run a loop from row 8 all the way to row 17 looking to see if this checkbox now how do i know if it's this checkbox well this checkbox is a specific character so if we go into insert and we click symbol what we're going to look for is this checkbox right here this is the checkbox this is called wingdings character 252 so i'm going to be looking for this character 252 if it's found so how do i know that well let's go into the code so first of all we're going to have a setup our setup row is going to be from 8 to 17. and so we're going to run that loop if the setup focus on column c in the setup row value equals character 252 selected okay if it's been selected i want to display and i want to build up a string that string is going to be used inside that's going to be inside that text range that's that shape is going to fill with that text range with all this text we got to build that up so basically what do i want to do i want to put the basically the label and i want to put the value i'm going to separate it by a colon so where's that label going to come that label is going to come from here the value is going to come from the variable the value is going to come directly from that so how do we know that well the where is it so if we take a look at this client everything here everything here client date start number in order is the, exactly the same order as our results client date start time everything we have here so how do we get that well the first thing what we want to do is determine how do we know what column we know what row right we're looping through the result rows from result three so we know the row but what i need to get the column so how do we, what column is this located on this is located on column 28. so now let's take a look inside our setup right this is located on row eight so if i'm looping from eight to 17 i need to do i need to get from row eight I need to get directly to column 28. So I can do that simply by adding 20. 20 will give us the column that this located on. Right? So we can do that. So if, if it's been selected, the first thing what I want to do is I want to add that label. That label is located inside B, column B, and whatever our row is, or our setup row here. So B and the setup row that's going to get our label then i want to add in a colon then i want to add in a space now what i want to do is i want to find the variable so that variable is located here we're focused again on the appointment database we're focused on that so we're going to use cells and then what i want to do is i want to know we know the result row we're looping through all the result rows so we know the result but again we don't know that column that column is going to be based on the setup row starting at eight plus 20 so that's going to get us our column right because everything's exactly shaped right so that's going to get us the value so whatever that value is but now what i want to do is i want to give it a specific format right if we take a look inside here on our appointments right look some have this format some have this format you know there's different 
formats, a date, right? How do I differentiate between these formats, right? Because I wanted to have a specific format. A date should have this format. A time should have this format. Well, what I can do is I can use the format of this cell, the format of this cell, and I can match it. So all I need to do is not only take the value from this cell, but the format. If we look in the home, we see that this is the time format. If we look in the home, we see that this is a date format. So not only do I want to extract the value, but I want to extract the format as well. So we can do that here. So notice here it says format, format here, and we're formatting. What format are we using? We're using the format of this. Let's scroll over. Keep scrolling back. The format of the same exact cell. That's how we do it. So we're going to take the number format of the same cell, and now we've been able to highlight it successfully. The format of whatever cell, we're going to use that as the format. And then what I want to do is I want to add a brand new line. All right? I want to add a carriage return, or basically the next line of data. So we're going to use carriage return, VB, CRLF, and that's going to be best next line of code. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep building up this string. That's why we're adding whatever is existing here. So we're going to loop through that, basically adding all those labels, all those datas, and the specific format into this string. And we can do that with just all of that with just three lines of code in a really simple loop. So this is going to build up all of the appointment details that we want displayed based on whatever is selected here inside the display. And that's a great way to do it. We've really condensed that into just a few lines of code because we've organized it in a pretty good way. Because we've made sure that our call, our rows here are exactly like our columns here. They're exactly the same. Where we've made, we've ensured that they're exactly the same. Okay, great. So now that we have that, we can move on with the code. Now we've got our string set up. So now what we want to do is I want to determine if we're going to be placing it directly on the schedule, what column and what row are we placing it? Well, our column is going to be based on whatever chair. Our row is going to be based on whatever time. So we need to extract both of those. So the schedule row is going to be based, based on the start time. I need to know the start time. We've got the appointment start time minus the scheduling start time divided by the interval plus seven. What is that crazy formula? If I know this starts at 8.15, right, how do I get column eight, right? So I know if I know our start time is eight, right? I know our start time is eight o'clock, always based on that. But if, if our appointment time is 8.15, if I subtract 8.15 minus eight, it's gonna give me 15 minutes. Right. If I then divide that by our interval, I'm going to get 1 divided by 1 is 1. So if I add on 7, right, we're starting, it's the reason we want to add. If I add 7 plus 1, it's going to give me 8. That's just what I've done right here. So inside our appointment start time, the start time, this was 8.15 minus 8 o'clock. This is going to give us 15 minutes. If I divide this 15 minutes by the schedule interval, which is also 15 minutes, that is going to give us 1. If I add 1 to 7, it's going to give us 8, and 8 is our schedule row. Great, so that's how we get our schedule row, but how do we determine what column? Well, what we know is we know our booking type. We've already defined our booking type here, not background type, Randy, our booking type here, so we have that. If I know right? If I've got our book in a named range, I've created a named range for all of our booking types here, formulas, name manager into booking types here, under booking types here, we've got them all here. So what I want to do is I want to search for them. If it's found, I want to know where it's found. If it's found, then I know where to place it, right? If it's found on four, let's say it's the first one, it's found on row four, where is it going to be placed on the schedule? Well, it's going to be based in column D, also in column four, right? So that means our column, column four, chair one, is also exactly the same as our row. So it's simple. Again, using good, good programming, we can see that row four is the same thing as column four. So that's all we need to do is use the find. So our our service column here, excuse me, let's go back down here, schedule column, here we go, schedule column, Based on the setup, based on the booking types, this name is, we're going to use find. I want to find the booking type, XL values, XL, and I want to re extract the row because that row is exactly the same as the column. Row four is the same as column D. Now I know the row. Now I know the column. Now I know exactly where to place it. Just in case, if for some reason it's not found, then if schedule column equals zero, then go to the next appointment. We're going to skip everything else, right, because we don't have a column to place it in. 
Assuming that we do have a correct column, we can then move on. Now we're ready to create the shape, the background for our appointment. So we can do that with our current sample background. We have a sample right here. This one's called sample at back. What I want to do is I want to duplicate that and then I want to give it a unique name. So we can do that with schedule, shapes, sample at back, duplicate it, give it a name. That unique name is going to be the appointment back and the appointment ID. So that appointment ID is unique. Remember, we have that name of that background unique to that appointment ID. So appointment back, appointment ID. Okay, once we've given a name, I can then work with it. First thing I wanna do is with schedule shapes, appointment back, appointment ID. So we're gonna work with that specific shape. If the service color, serve color, does not equal empty, then we wanna set the back color. Remember, I've put that in a variable it's coming directly from here style 27 25 but what i don't need is i don't need this uh the word style i only need 27 27 is all i need to set it up so how do we do that well so what i want to do is i want to take that uh service color and i want to remove the word style from it i only want the number i want to extract that number so to do that we're going to use the replace the replace service style removing the style replacing with nothing and we're going to do the dot shape style so now when we do dot shape let's do equals right let's take a look you see we've got all these styles here right so this is what i wanted to show you here so we've got different style different presets so we're going to use basically 23 24 25 so they're already in here preset 23 24 now we don't need that entire text all we need is the number that's sufficient enough so 23 24 so all i want to do is put that number in the shape style and it's going to automatically give it that shape style so that's what i wanted to show you there so all i need to do is put in the number there so if i were to put in 23 here it would be 23 every time so that's all we need to do is make sure we extract the name we don't need a name just the numbers all we're looking for so we're going to put in extract number for the shape style all right so that colors the background that gives us that unique now what i want to do is i want to add the text remember everything's got some unique text how do i add the text to that shape well see it says appointment back one so we've got the back plus we have the id now we want to give it a text so we can use the text frame for that so text frame two text range dot text equals the appointment details that is that string variable that we built up based on our loop up here so that's going to set all the appointment text now what i want to do is i want to set the left position where's the left it's going to be based on the column what column we set the row doesn't matter when we're setting the left position so we can use row one that's fine the schedule cells one is fine the schedule column the left position of that schedule i also want to set the top position again in this case the it is the column that doesn't matter we can use column one that is the row that matters so we're going to base it on that row and i want to place it just a slightly off the top edge of that so i'm going to add one to that now what i want to do is i want to add the height now the height of this shape is based directly on the number of rows we have the schedule of rows right so if the if we have the schedule of rows is based on that if i know it's going to be four rows what is the height of that shape the height of that shape is going to be basically be the height of a single row times four and that's just what we've done here so all i want to do is i want to know the height of that row what is the height of that row and i want to multiply it times four and then i want to just make it a little bit smaller because i don't want to directly up that so that's all we're gonna do so simply the multiply the number of rows times the height of one row that'll get a shape and then subtract a little bit now i also want the width of that right i want those width dynamic if i bring those width in and i want to update the schedule i want to make sure that the width is automated too so the width of that the width of that shape is going to be based on the schedules the column width so whatever the column width is is going to be the width of the shape okay that's it now we placed our background our shape now it's time for the employee picture Okay. So what I want to do now is I want to duplicate. Now, regardless, what I want to do is I want to put this here, regardless if a picture is found or not. So I'm going to place that there. So all we need to do is take our sample staff picture and we need to duplicate that and give it a unique name also. So sample staff picture, duplicate. This one's going to be called staff pick and appointment ID. 
now what we want to do is check if the picture name does not equal empty. That means there is a value. The picture name has directly been extracted from AM here. So we know that if it is not empty, then we can move forward. Now what I want to do is I want to set the path of that picture. This is another string variable. The path of that picture is based on the picture folder that we've already added in, right? That picture folder was already added all the way up here, right? Based on the setup C19. So we have the picture path and the picture folder combining the picture name and the picture folder. This is the full file picture path, full file picture path. But I do want to run one more check. I want to make sure that that is accurate, right? So to do that, if the directory of the picture path VB does not equal empty, then it is accurate. Then what I want to do is I want to fill, I want to take that circle, that circle that we just created with this name here, put it in here, and I want to give it a fill. I want to fill it based on a user picture. That user picture file path is located here. That's going to fill that little shape with our staff picture. And that's all we have to do to add the picture. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to place, I want to position. All we've done is duplicated it and possibly added the picture, but we haven't placed it anywhere yet. And I want to place it basically on the lower right of whatever the shape is. So based on wherever the shape is, I want to place it on the lower right of our background shape. To do that, we can say with the schedule based on this staff picture, we're going to put the left position is going to be based on the left position of our background, the left position plus the width of our background minus 17. So basically, I want to know the left position of this plus the width of this. If it's plus the width, it's going to end up on the outside. But if I subtract the width of that, it's going to move it back over to the left. So in this case, we're using 17. That's going to be in the back. I'm going to do the same thing for the top. The top is going to be basically the top of this shape plus the height of this shape minus a little bit about 17 again. So we're going to do that with the top. So the top is going to be the top position of this background, plus we're going to add the height of the background, minus 17. That's going to place that picture or that circle with the picture directly in the lower right-hand corner of the shape. All right, now what I want to do is I want to take both of this. Notice that this is a group. I want to take this background shape. I want to take this picture, and I want to group them together. And I want to give it a specific name. I want to call it a point and then I want to put the ID in. So we do that with just a few lines of code here. With the schedule, shapes range, where you're going to use an array. That array is going to be based on the two shapes. That shape is the background shape name and the staff picture shape name. And I'm going to group those. And then what I want to do is I want to give it a specific name. The name is going to be the appointment ID, point, the text appointment and appointment ID. This text is very important because when we remove all the shapes, we're looking exactly for that way up here. We're looking for a point. So we want to make sure that we name that group something that we can remove it. All right, so we've given it that name, and that's it, that we loop through every single picture to do that. We want to clear out the string, and then we want to go into the next result row. That's all we have to do to create that refresh schedule. So automatically, it is that that we have to do to refresh that schedule. And it's that one that when we save an appointment, when we go to previous and next day, I'll show you those macros that's how we refresh the schedule okay so again previous day it's very very simple remember our this particular one d5 is based on the day that we selected this criteria inside appointments is also based on d5 so if i reduce day five by one and then i refresh the schedule that's all we need to do so that's just what i've done inside the previous day macro d5 is equal to d5 minus one refresh the schedule. The next day, same thing except for D5 equals D5 plus one and then refreshing the schedule. Today, very simple. We're going to take D5 and we're going to place the current date, current date here. And then refreshing the schedule. Very, very simple. Okay, that's it. That's all so we have to do. So that way we do previous day, today, previous day, there's no points for today or next day. Very easy on that. All right, great. But what about the macro that we run when we select this? When I select it, I want a few things. I want to edit that or I want to create an invoice. I want some things to happen when I select it. That is the macro called appointment select. And that macro is right here. So we're going to focus primarily on the schedule with this. I want to get an appointment ID. Now, this is very important. That appointment ID I need to extract. Now, let's take a look. Remember in the, in the macro we just went over, we created a name called whether it was for the shape or the background shape or the picture, they have a specific name. This one's called appointment back. So notice that there's eight characters here and then the number. Look at this. This is also called, this is called staff pick. This is also 
eight characters and then the number. So if I want to extract, when I select this, I want to extract the name. I know I want to get the name of the shape, but I, what I really want is the ID. I want to take that ID and I want to place it directly inside B2. So if it's one, I want to place it. So notice that this shape here is, let's right click, let's click something else here. This shape here is called appointment back, right? One, appointment back one, there we go. Appointment back one, that's the one. So what I want to do is I want to remove the first eight characters. Whatever's left is going to be that appointment ID, no matter how many characters that ID is. It could be ID 123, that's not going to be a problem. So we can do that, extracting that appointment ID, we're going to do that. What we're going to do is I'm going to get the take the left of the application caller. This is the name of the shape that called the macro. Again, if we went over the report, if we try to run this macro from there, it is going to give us the debug. Why is that? Because the name there is no name of the shape that called this macro. I called it from right here, this button. There's no name, so that's going to, of course, provide a bug. So what I want to do is I want to take the first eight characters and I want to replace them with nothing. The first eight characters of this, we're going to use the replace. What am I replacing with nothing? What's that going to leave me with? That's going to leave me with exactly the appointment ID. I'm going to take that ID and I'm going to place it directly inside of B2. Then I'm going to run the macro to load the appointment. Then what I want to do is I want to set the appointment group to equal the appointment ID in the group. This is that group, right? Remember, the group is the combination of those two shapes. I want to select it. Why do I want to select it? Because the user might want to move it. So if they want to move it, I need to select it. So I need to know what that group is so that we can select it and move back and forth. So to do that, oops, I moved it too far to the left. I'll be showing you that in a minute. That's important. We want to make sure we move it within the schedule. So to do that, we need to make sure we identify the group name and that group name we're going to set it as a group this is the shape remember we've defined that appointment group as a shape right here as a shape so we're going to set that in as a group so to do that because i need to get some information from it so we can do that right here set the appointment group equal to shapes appoint and the appointment id now that we know the id we've already extracted it we know the name of the group because it's always going to be the word appointment group so we're going to set it now what i want to do is i want to set the appointment change to false b9 is going to go to false this will you'll understand this very soon when we go to the next macro but also b10 i want to set the left position i when i click here i need to know the left position of that shape i need to know the top position of that shape and notice how these things change so the B10 is going to take on the left position. B11 is going to take on the top position. When I move one of these, it's going to change, and I need to know. So basically, when I move this over, it's going to say, hey, you've moved that over. We know that there's a difference now, so we can go ahead and make the update of that appointment based on the differences in that left position or the differences in that top position. And so that's just what we have here. So what I want to do is when I select it, I first want to set that so I want to take that left position of that group and I want to place it in B10. I want to take the top position of that group and I want to place it in B11. Now what I want to do is I want to focus on that with the shape to select the primary group. Remember, when I select it, I also want to have the ability to edit it, or which is going to open this up. And also I want to have the ability to also create an invoice from it. So this is going to be based on this group. So I need to display this group. And I want to position this group directly on the top. And I want to display it directly on the right of the shape. So we do that with here. So with the selected group, first thing is the left position is going to be based the left position of that group plus the width of that group. That's going to place it directly to the right of that shape. And also I want to match the top position. I want to make sure it's visible and I want to make sure that, that uh, those two icons are on top of anything else. Right? I don't want them. If I select here, I, I want to make sure that these icons are on the top of this shape. I don't want them the under. I want them to all the way on the top above every other shape. To do that, we can set the Z order. So we want the Z order to be to MSO bring to front. So it's going to bring it all, make sure that that group is not under any other shapes. Okay, and then what I want to do is I want to actually select that group. You notice that when I select it each time, it, you see that it's now selected. So we can do that with this line of code. 
group select. We're going to select that. Again, B9 to false, setting B9 to false, making sure that it is false here. And then oh, we don't probably don't need that twice in here, but just in case, it's probably good just in case. And we're, then we're going to run a macro called check for move. It is that macro that we're going to go over next. Basically, this macro is going to run a loop. It's going to wait and see if we're making a move, wait for a certain number of seconds or minutes and see if the user is going to move it. So it is that what we're going to cover right now. So first of all, if B2 is empty, then we're going to exit this up, right? We can't, if we don't have any kind of an appointment ID selected, there's no point in moving forward. We need to make sure that we actually have a selected appointment ID. Okay, assuming that we do, we're going to set that into a variable appointment ID. This is where we're going to run our delay, right? Count delay, this is a whole number we've defined. We're going to run a delay, right? We need to wait a certain period, a number, so to see if the user changes it, right? So we're going to run that delay using a for next loop. So we're going to do 1 to 100,000. Then what we want to do is we want to be able to do other things while this is happening. So to do that, we're going to add in do events. Then what I want to do is I as soon as B9, I want to be able to exit this loop out at any point. As soon as a user makes a change, notice it's false right now, but as soon as a user makes a change to the location, that's going to go to true. I want to make sure that we exit out of that loop as soon as B9 goes to true. So we do that with this line of code here. So as soon as B9 equals true, we're going to end. We're exiting out the loop, right? There's nothing left. I want to make sure we exit out of that. Okay, so now what we do is check to see if the user has made a change by basing it as it continues to loop and loop through we're going to continue to look for changes i'm going to look for a change in that left position i'm going to look for a change in that top position so with we're going to focus on this group of shape that group if the left position right does not equal b10 right that's where our left position if there's been a change to the left position or there's been a change to the top position in b11 then i know the user has changed or the top position of that group is different from what's in B11. Then a move has been detected. Now we want to make sure that the move is a correct move, right? If we take this shape and we move it way too far over, I need to let the user know, but please make sure to move the appointment to a correct time and open, right? I also want to make sure they don't move it too high up. If it's moved too high up off the schedule, please make sure to move the appointment to correct. Just let them know. So the first thing we need to check for, have they move it to a correct position? So we do that with these lines of code. If the left position is less than the left position of column D, right? We cannot go less than column D. So if it's less than the column D, then it's been moved too far to the left. How, or if the schedule uh, row six and the top left column doesn't equal empty that means here row six there's nothing there right if there's nothing here here in m then we've moved it too far over to the right so we need to make sure that row six and whatever column they moved over contains a value and so we make sure that it does contain a value so we can do that or row six equals empty or maybe the top position is less than row seven if the top position they moved it too high up right then let the user know please make sure to move the appointment to a correct time and open based on the booking type right and open right all right so then we're going to refresh the schedule so that their changes come back right we're refreshing the schedule without doing else Okay, but what if they've made a correct move? What if they made a move in a good position? Then what I want to do is I want to get all the information and save those changes that I make. First of all, I want to know the booking type, right? That booking type is going to be based. Where have they moved it to? For example, if chair six, if they've moved it to chair seven, I need to know what they've moved it to. It's going to be based on row six and whatever column they've moved it to. So it's going to be equal to row six and whatever the top left column of the column, what, where have they moved it to? What column? That's coming in six. So we're going to put that into a variable. I also want to know, well, I want to take, then put it, then I want to do it. I want to take it and put it into F3. I want to take that, once they've moved it here, I want to put that new chair right into F3. So if I've moved it over here, if moved over chair 8, I want to take that and I want to put chair 8 directly in the, into F3. So that's how we do it right here. So F3 is going to take on that new booking type. Also, I want to know the start time. What is the what is the new start time? Have they moved it up or down? Where's that start time going to be located? That start time is located in in column C. So if they've decided they don't want to know more, they don't want an 8 o'clock, maybe they want an 815 and they've moved it down. I need to find out based on the row, based on the top row of that, 
it has a move it to h15. So to get that, what we're going to do is we're going to base it on column C in the top left cell, the row of that shape. What is the top left cell row? What row is that? And that's going to be our start time based on column C. That's going to set our new start time. And also what I want to do is I want to take that new start time and I want to put it directly inside h2. h2 is going to take on that new time. Once I have that new time, right, I also want to set the move to true, right? Move is to true. That's going to exit out of that loop, right? As soon, now we're done, right? As soon as B9 becomes true, it's going to exit out. So setting this to true is going to exit out of the loop. And then all I want to do is I want to save those changes. We've just made those changes here. We've changed the chair. We've changed the, the, the possible start time. And now what I want to do is save those. So basically inside here, just click save appointment and then refresh the schedule, which will automatically refresh. All right, that's it. That's all we have to do. So we just keep running that loop until the user made changes. And if the loop runs out before we go, then we're gonna make sure that B9 is true. That's gonna exit out of any loop automatically. That is how we automatically save and make changes based on a drag and drop schedule simply by dragging and dropping into a new location. Okay, great. I'm glad I've got to show that to you. But what about how do we create the invoice? Now we have an invoice here. How do we do that? Well, as I explained before, when I select it, we've got an appointment ID. I need to know if there's an invoice that's been selected. If we notice appointment six, there's no invoice that's been created for that. If we go into the invoice list, we see that we have appointment ID and I'm going to double check this. There's nothing that's been created for that. So we know that it's going to be a new one. So what do I want to do? Well, in this case, basically what I want to do is I want to go through the invoice. I want to clear everything out here by clicking on new invoices. Then what I want to do is I want to add in the client name. I want to add in the next invoice number. I want to add in service item one and possibly service item two. Where are those going to come from? It's going to come directly from here h3 or here j5 it's going to have those secondary items so that's what we want to do in here so with the schedule b9 first of all i want to make sure the move appointment setting that move a point all right meant to true and to exit any loops i want to exit i still spelled that wrong I'll probably spelled wrong three more times uh, move appointment to true that's going to exit any loops right so basically Regard if they select it here and then they decide to create an invoice automatically by clicking, this is the this is the one we're going over. This is the macro that's been assigned to this dollar sign, right? That's the one we're going over here called create invoice. So first thing we want to do is make sure that B9 is true, right? If B3 equals empty, please select. We have to make sure that we at least have an appointment ID, right? Have to have, we also have to have a row and we have to have an appointment ID to make sure it's been saved. If it's not, we need to let the user know to please select an appointment or view to view an invoice or to, let's say to create, let's call it to create an invoice. That makes better English. Okay, we're exiting the step out. So now what I want to do is I want to run the macro. We'll go over these macros in a minute, but basically this macro simply clears out the invoice screen. And then also what I want to do is I need to determine, is this an existing invoice? If it's an existing invoice, like this one is an existing, right? So we know that the appointment ID for has been created on invoice row six. So if I take a look at the invoice list, I know that on row six, appointment ID four has been created. So all I need to do is take that ID in this case and load it, put it in here. This is a search invoice. So when I do that, it's going to automatically load that. So let's change that to one. Let's differ. Let's change that. So now when I go into schedule and I decide, okay, I want to load this invoice. I want to click here. It's going to do just that. It's going to load automatically for and load in those two. So it's loading an existing invoice because an invoice has already been created for that appointment. If this is blank, we know it's not. So we need to differentiate whether it's been created or not. We can use B12 to differentiate differentiate existing invoice lovely spelling here existing invoice so if it is an existing it does not equal empty that means it is an existing invoice on the invoice screen j1 value is going to be based on whatever row here's the row of the invoice what is an a in the invoice list let's take a look at that here inside this invoice list here what's located in a is the invoice id i know the row is six I want to extract this. I want to take this four and I want to place it directly inside J1 because our change event, which I'll go over in a moment, is automatically going to load that invoice. Okay, so we have that there. So that's it. all we need to do. That's going to automatically trigger to load the invoice. Any change on J1, assuming it is a correct invoice number, is going to load that invoice. But what if it's a new invoice? Well, if it's a new invoice, then I want to run this invoice new. We don't need two of these. We've already done it here, so we don't need to do it again here. So 
All right, so first thing I want to do is I want to determine the appointment row based on B3. That's the row I want to know, the row of that appointment, the row that's been saved already. It's a previously saved located in B3 because we're going to need that information. That's going to be an appointment row. Then what I want to do is I want to, inside the invoice, I want to save some screen. E is going to take on our client name. Where's our client name going to come from? It's going to come, could come from two locations. It could come from here right or it could come from our appointments we've already got the appointment row or it could come directly from column b and the appointment row so that's what we've done here appointment database b and the appointment row is our client name we're going to extract our invoice date you're going to set up our invoice date based on d5 i'm going to default the invoice date based on our scheduling date right here which is located in d4 that's going to set that invoice date and our invoice date is going to go directly inside h2 all right so once we have that i also want to set the staff that staff's going to locate it in g7 g7 is going to take on our staff here's g7 and it's going to come directly from our appointments located right here inside G, the column G in our staff row. All right, so once we have that, D9 is going to take on our primary service. Now, our primary service is going to be located inside I, right? Our primary service and our secondary service is going to be in J if there is any. All right, so our primary service is going to go directly inside D9. Our secondary service is going to go directly in D10 if there is any and that's it that's all we have to do there's one more thing that i needed to do which i forgot remember there was a missing so what i also want to do is i want to take that i've got a special place directly inside our appointment id right here b5 b5 is going to take on our appointment id so i want to do that i want to take our appointment id directly from our schedule our appointment id is located in b2 so that's the last thing that was the last thing that we had to do so invoice dot range b5 dot value is equal to right, our schedule dot range and it's b3 b2 excuse me b2 is going to take our appointment id so that's the last thing i'm going to do appointment id i want to save that appointment id and make sure that that's saved right so the b5 is going to take on our appointment id and our appointment is going to come directly from here so that four is going to be brought directly inside it's for new directly inside our invoices right here so i'm going to put it directly here once it gets saved it is then going to get saved directly inside here okay great so that's it so then all we need to do is save then we just activate the invoice screen so let's take a look at that so let's find one that has not been created this one right here let's take a look here this one right here has not been created notice that there's no invoice row associated with that so if i select on invoice here everything's going to be brought over so let's just double check that because it was kind of quick so i've selected this one we have our hair color it is our appointment id is five our client is dolores so when we look back over here our client is dolores our appointment id five which is working correctly where i want it our haircut standard our hair color two and that creates our invoice okay great so we know how we brought everything over our date here has come over our invoice number four has been brought over here so that's very good so how do we do that so actually i probably want to do one more thing and that, that is going to i think it's on save but i want to do one more thing our next invoice number is going to be based on the max of all the invoices. i want to bring that over let's say h1 is going to be equal to b7 so let's add that while we're in here so invoice dot range h1 dot value is equal to dot range and we're going to take it i want to know the next one b7 is our next invoice id let's set that up next invoice id good so we've got our next invoice id is going to come directly from b7 it's going to be placed in here that's going to set that up i like that better let's do that one more time select on this one here and then we'll select the invoice making sure that we have our next one oops invoice okay there we go well, let's try that one more time invoice we got to set the invoice okay there we go that's going to be correct so now we do that and now we've got our invoice number here that's what i want brought directly from here we have our correct appointment id we have our information great so now we understand how to get that but how do first of all how do we get this address to automate how did we are we going to be able to save it and those are going to be inside our invoice macros so let's take a look inside first inside the actions on the invoice screen here the invoice screen we've got some worksheet changes here so when a user makes a change on a customer name i want that address to appear if we decide to change that customer here but anyway i want to make sure that that address changes accordingly inside e5 and e6 so basically i want to look up to see if this customer is found and then place address well we have a customer row right i've got a client name here we can use the mask to determine the customer row as long as b3 is not blank i can then load 
the address one and the address two directly inside that. And that's going to come directly from our clients, right? So we want in from column C, and then I want D, E, and F to appear in the second row. So to do that, we're going to, if the user makes a change to E4 and the target value doesn't equal empty, I want to make sure that there is a customer row. That customer row is based on the invoice screen. I want to make sure it's not empty. B2 must contain a value inside our invoice, right? If it is, if it's not, then we don't have a correct customer. Assuming that those things are true, I'm going to dimension the client row is long and the client row is going to be equal to whatever's in B2. That's our customer or client row. E5 is going to take on whatever's in C, which is that main address inside our from our client's row. And then inside the row below, which is E6, I want to combine both the city, the state, and the zip code coming from columns D, column E, and column F. It's going to combine all of that and of course we're going to separate it by a comma and a space. So that is going to bring the address in here, our city, our state, and then if there's a zip code, we're going to put it in here. Mobile, Alabama, 35. So that's all we have. That's all we need. We probably should put the comma after the city. I think that makes more sense. Don't you? So let's add a comma in here and then remove the comma here. I like that better. Okay, so just some small details to make it look a little bit better. So now when we click Betty White here, okay, so now in mobile, that looks much better. So we understand how we're going to get that address in here. So that's all we really need to do to automate the name change. But what about if I want to add more items, right? If I want to add like a wash and dry, I want to make sure that the description automatically appears, the quantity and the cost. Now, if this looks familiar, I do have an invoice from scratch that this was modeled from. So if you want to see this completely from scratch, check out YouTube invoice from scratch. This thing was built from scratch for that video. This video, obviously we're going long on it. So, but basically on any change to D, although I've made some changes on this one, usually we have the row, but that's not necessary anymore. If there's any change to D, I want to find this item. If this item inside our service items has been found, I'm going to extract the row. What row is it found on? And then I want to put in the item description, and then I want to put in the price. So, and I want to default the quantity to one. So that's just what we're going to do in here on invoice item, but not on invoice load, right? I want to differentiate between those two changes. If I make a change, if I load this invoice, right, I want to make a change. That's all these are going to be automated. But the kind of change that I want when a user makes a change or when the invoice is loading, those are two different types of change. So I need to differentiate that because the change event is going to trigger no matter what. So if I differentiate between those, it won't change. So I can do that with invoice load. When the invoice load, when I search for an invoice, it's going to load automatically. This will go to true. So I need to differentiate between that. So uh, there's another change, but if I do this, that's another change. So I want to make sure that B6 is false. So we can do that here. If the user makes a change to any item name, and B6 is false, then what we want to do is make sure that D in the target row is not empty. Okay, but if it is, then what we want to do is do something else, and I'll fill that in right now. So dimension the item row. I need to find that item row as long. Okay, I'm going to set that item row. It's going to be based on the service items. It can be based on the service names. I'm looking for that target value. I'm looking in the values and whole. And I want to look for the row. If it is found, if the item row does not equal empty or not equal zero, then I want to take the information from C, which is the item description in the service items, and place it in column E. I want to set the default quantity to one in column F. And I want to take the sales price, which is in column G in our service items, and I'll place it directly in column E. All right, that's going to, but what if it's empty? Well, if it's empty, what I want to do is I want to delete everything, right? But it's not happening yet. Why is that? Well, because I haven't programmed it in yet. So if the target value is empty, then I want to clear out E, F, and G. So that's what we're going to do here. If it's empty, then range E and the target row and through and then G and the target dot row clear the contents, clear those contents. Okay, so we're clearing it out that way if it's done. And I also want to delete the, any database row that's been associated with or clearing out the database. If there's, an, if there's a row in the database, this is where our database row is located. If this is existing, then I want to make sure to clear it. So now it's fine, that's great, but what if I decide I want to delete this? I need to, it's, nothing's going to happen if I don't delete this row. So if our database row is existing in column I, I also need to delete it inside the database row. So we can do that. Basically, it is this row here that I want to delete, right? So I want to make sure it's deleted inside our invoice items so that it doesn't come back. So we need to check in I. So we can do that through here. If dot range I 
and the target row. Let's do and and the target dot row dot value does not equal empty. Does not equal empty. Then we need to delete it, right? So then, how do we do that? So we could do our invoice items, invoice items. Well, actually, we can dimension it. Probably be a little bit easier. So we'll just say dimension. Let's say invoice item. Call this invoice item database row as long. A little bit easier. And what we're going to do is I'm just going to call this one here. It's going to be our database row. So copy this. So and then we'll say invoice item database rows equal to that. Okay, so that's the row that's been associated. So now we're just ready to delete. So invoice items dot range. And what is it? It's that row invoice item database row and colon and and then the database and again invoice item database row and then we're going to entire row dot delete. Okay, so dot entire row dot delete. Okay, so that's going to delete this entire row. So now we save it our work, of course, and now let's give it a try. So now when I delete this, let's just do delete. So now, oh, going to fix that dot range. We don't need dot, not dot. We're on the sheet, so we don't need dot. So that's fine. Uh, if we're on the sheet, we don't need that. Okay. So continuing on. Okay. So let's take a look. So let's do that and delete it. And also, what we want to do. So now six has been cleared up. But we also need to delete it here under hair. So let's do the last thing. The last thing here we want to do is. I and the target row clear those contents out. So, clearing those contents out. Dot clear contents. So now when we load it again, it's not going to be there. Clearing the contents out. Clear contents. Okay. So saving our work. So now that's no longer going to be here. So if I decide I'm going to load, and it automatically loaded without that last row. So just three items now. Okay. So that's how we both add items here. And we clear items. There we go. So now, what about if we change the invoice? So now, did you notice here? I just changed. Remember, we spoke of J1 when I added that invoice. That little search here. When I add an invoice here, it's automatically going to load here. So how do we do that? So that's very, very simple. That's going to be just with a little macro. All we need to do is run a change event based on J1. And of course, if J1 is not empty, then what I want to do is I want to make sure that we have certain row based on that. So if I put a number in here, I want that number to be associated with the search row. So based on J1 here, search row matching J1, I want to match the invoice ID found if it's been found at to otherwise blank, right? So I know if B4 contains a value. I know what database row that's associated with. So, if it's empty, let the user know. Please not found. So if I enter something that doesn't exist, it's going to be a message box saying invoice not found. Please enter. But if it does exist, then all I need to do is just enter one or whatever it is, and it's going to be found. Okay. So it is that same formula that we're using inside here, except we're just using a different. So this way we're using H1 based on the existing invoice. This one we're using J1 based on the searched for invoice number. Same formula, just different cell. Okay, so now that we have that, all we all we need to do is assuming that we do have a correct value in before. All I need to do is take that ID located in J1 and place it directly in H1. So once I place whatever's here inside H1, this should be invoice number. And so once we have that, we can then place it directly inside here. Invoice. There we go. Cleared it back up. Must have cleared those out. I'll better fix that. That was based on the clear contents here. Okay, so now we have that. So what I want to do is I want to make sure that we have it. So once we have those values, all we need to do is just then run the macro to load the invoice. And that macro is what we're going to be covering next. Inside our invoice macros, we'll go over some of the macros that are associated with this invoice. First one is going to be save and update. I'm running a bit long today. Well, we're always long, but we're even longer than normally long. So what I want to do is I want to determine is it a new or existing invoice, right? So again, our invoice row, if that's blank, it's going to be a new invoice. If it is not blank, it is going to be an existing invoice. So we determine that if B3 is empty, it is a new invoice. We're going to determine the invoice row based on the first available of our invoice list items. We're going to set our brand new 
invoice number H1 based on B7. We're going to add, remember, this is that max formula that's going to determine the next invoice number. We're going to place that directly in H1. I'm going to also take that brand new invoice number placed in column A, and I want to take whatever appointment ID is located in B5 and place that, right? We want to place only for new ones. We're going to be replacing, placing that invoice ID in the appointment ID here. So let's do it. Let's go back to the schedule, creating an invoice, clicking here, creating that invoice. We're going to show that that invoice. Now we'll go ahead and save and update update that invoice. All right, and taking a look inside the invoice list, we have our brand new invoice, our appointment ID has showed up. Everything is here that exactly the way we want it. Okay, and back into our invoice macros here. So all I'm scrolling up here. So what I want to do is saving an update. We are going to do all this only for new invoices. If an existing invoice, all I need to do is extract the row from B3. So invoice, right? And then all we need to do is just simply add in the information. We're not using data mapping. It's only about four rows, so it's fine. Small amount of data. The date is going to go in column C. Column D is going to take on the customer name. Assigned staff is going to go into E and F. Those are going to all come from the invoice. So basically, it's just going to go inside date, customer, staff, and total. And they're all going to come directly from here. Date staff the total is going to come directly inside from h and then it's going to bring all that and of course the appointment id is coming from here so that's going to bring it all information okay but now what i want to do is i want to update all these items and i want to go no, I want to basically run through all the items, determine the last row, and I want to know if it's been added to the database, the invoice item database row. If there's a number here, 12 and 13, it's been, it's been added already. We would need to make the update if necessary. That is going to be here. Notice row 12 and 13, this is where those items get saved. Invoice row 9 and 10, database row with a formula 9 and 10. So that's what we're going to do inside our add and update invoice. So first we're going to determine the last row of the item. It's going to be based on D28, which is the last possible row here. We're going to determine the last row, in this case 10. So I want to loop through those. So if it's less than 9, we're going to go to no items. If it is not, we're going to loop starting in row 9 going to the last item. And then what I want to do is I wanted to know, is it an existing row or not? Has, the, has this item been saved to the database or not? I, if I is blank, it's going to tell us if it's not. So if I does not equal empty, then we know that the invoice item row is going to be equal to whatever's I in the row. This is the invoice item database row. Otherwise, it is a new. We have to assign it a new one. That's going to be the first available row based on that inside our invoice items row. I'm going to take that invoice number, whatever's in H1, I'm going to place it in the first column. I'm going to place the invoice item row, whatever row that is, I'm going to place it in I, right? I need to know, place it right in here. So that means basically if we loop through these and we decide we're going to add a new item, I want to place whatever the next database row is this will be 14. Now I want to place that 14 directly inside here. So when I save it, it is that 14 that's going to get placed here. Okay, so now that we know where that invoice row, I also want to add a formula. Notice a formula inside column G, and that formula is going to dictate the row. Why is it a formula? Why is that important? Because if I decide to delete a row, I need to make sure the rest of these get automatically updated. That's why they're all formulas in column G based on the row. So that way, if we decide to delete one, they automatically get updated. They're always accurate. So now the rest we're going to do, regardless if it is a new or an existing item, we're going to do this. I'm going to take whatever's inside uh, D through G and place it in B through E. What do I mean by that? B through G, right? All, all the way B through E, excuse me, there. I want to know the item, the description, the quantity, and the price. I want to bring all of that directly from whatever's here, from all the way from D through G. All that information is going to come and go directly into the database. And I also want to put in the item row in F. F is going to take, so this is item row 11. I want to take that item row 11 and I want to place it directly inside F. So we're bringing all this information into our database. Great, that's all we need to do, just loop through that. And then what I want to do is I want to run a fade out message. Do you notice every time I click save on that invoice, you see this little message pops up? Well, this message is simply a shape. If I click on our selection, and we show all, we see that this is a shape it's called invoice saved. This is called the invoice saved message shape. So this shape basically is going to fade out. I did this in the training before, a few of them. So this is with the invoice saved message. I'm going to run this macro. It's a macro that fades out the message. So we're going to invoice shape save message. We're focused on this shape on the sheet. 
We're going to dimension i as long, delay as a double, and a start time as double. I'm basically, just going to run a loop. I'm going to make sure that it's perfectly visible, and then we're just going to simply run a loop and dim the transparency as it grows. The transparency grows and grows and grows until it becomes almost, uh, you know, invisible. Then the last thing we're going to do is just making that shape um, basically visible equals false. So if we want to make it faster, we can uh, lower the delay or increase the delay to make it slower, or we can change the transparency. But basically, this time or this delay can make it slower or faster. All right, great. So what about invoice new? Invoice new, again, all I'm going to do is just set the invoice load to true and then return it back to false. Then we're going to clear out a bunch of cells, and then we're going to set the current date. I want to default the current date. So when I do new invoice, I want to make sure that the current date is always on the default. Okay. All right. So that's it. Just clears out a bunch of the cells and makes sure we're clearing out the columns row. Right. If we save it, that invoice is going to be automatically gone. Okay. So what about if I want to load the invoice? Right. I want in to load it. We certainly need to make sure that we have a row. If there's no row associated with this invoice, we can't load it. So first thing we want to do is check to make sure that B3 contains a value. If it's not. Let the user know to please select the correct inventory. B6, first of all, we're going to set B6 load to true. And then before the macro ends, we're going to set it to false. First thing I want to do then is I want to set the invoice row based on what's in B3. I want to clear everything out, clearing all the fields out. And then what I want to do is I want to set the appointment ID based on whatever's in B5. Whatever's in column B, put that in B5. Whatever's inside column C is our date, put that at H2. And our customer is going to go in E4. Now, keep in mind, as soon as we place it in E4, that customer address is automatically going to populate, assuming the customer has been found. Then what I want to do is I want to load the items. Right? I want to know I've already added right. As soon as I make a change here, that address is going to be loaded. So if I delete that and I just double click on here, no matter what, the address is going to automatically populate. Now we need to load in our items. But I need to know what items are only associated with this invoice number. It's in H1. So we have our invoice items here. I want to run an advanced filter based on all this data. That criteria is going to be based on invoice H1. So we're going to run and we're going to have those results come directly in here. Then all we need to do is loop through the results. I need to determine what row in the invoice to place it. Once I know the row, we can place those items directly in the invoice. So that's what we do here. The last row based on the invoice items. If the last row is less than three, then we can do it or no items. We're going to run that advanced filter based on all the data in those invoice items. We're going to have our criteria based on that invoice ID i2 to i3 here's our criteria and our results are going to come from k into k2 through q2 those are our results k2 so we're going to copy those results from k2 into q2 then what we're going to do is we're going to determine the last results row based on column k and if that last results row is less than three then there's no items so we can go to no items it's going to skip everything and go down to here if there are results we're going to then loop through the results for starting at row three going to the last results row First thing I need to know is that invoice item row. What row in the invoice are we placing? Are we placing on row 9, 10, or 11? That row is going to come directly located in column P, 9, 10, or 11. So to get that, we need to put that into a variable based on column P. Once we have that, I can bring all the information over. D through G is simply going to equal L through O. D through G on the invoice here, D through G, is going to simply equal whatever is located on our invoice from L through O, bring in all the information. Lastly, I want to, in column I, I want to bring in the database. That database is going to come from column Q, right? That database, that row 3, 4, 5, must go into column I, 3, 4, 5 here, so we know it's associated with the specific row. All right, that's it, all we need to do there. And then I want to set load to false. We're also going to be printing that invoice very easily, print it to the default printer. Clicking on print is going to set it to the default printer. I've already set the print range. Snagit is my default printer here. I've already set that print range based on this very, very easily. Notice that we have a tax, right? Now this tax is variable. We have a setup screen here based on this. So we know if B C22 is no, then show nothing. If it's yes, then we need to show it. So inside the invoice, we have here if the tax option, that's called the tax option, equals yes, that's the name range I set for that, then what we do is we're going to show the tax. I want to show text and the tax and the percentage. I want to format that over the percentage. And I want to show that percentage. So that's going to show that tax 5%. Right, so we take a look here. This is the tax option. This is what's called tax name. So this is the tax name. So I've given it a name. 
that's it. Then what I want to do is I want to calculate it. If G30 equals empty, it does not equal empty, right? If there's nothing here, then show nothing. Otherwise, what I want to do is I want to take that tax, whatever that rate is, and multiply it by the subtotal. That's going to add in our tax, and then we have our total. That is pretty much it. So printing, new invoice, saving invoices. And also, if you notice, lastly, there's a background here. I've got a really cool picture background. If you weren't aware of it, Excel has that feature. We can, inside the page layout, you can see delete background. It's going to clear that background. I've got a custom background. I'll include this picture inside of Patreon if you like that. Patreon background, and I just have a picture here, so we can click on the picture. And then we can just click insert and it's going to insert that background there. Got an incredible scheduling training where we've shown you how to create this incredible drag and drop spa and salon manager complete with scheduling complete with employee pictures drag and drop navigation on the display employee pictures one click invoicing and it's been an incredible training thank you so much for joining me don't forget check out our patreon we've got a lot more head in there if you got any ideas you want me to add to this or anything you want me to fix or maybe an area you want me to focus on i'm doing that every single week for every single video on our patreon so i hope you'll join us there on patreon we'll see you there and thanks so much see you next week mm -hmm.